Go right ahead. Opening remarks. Thanks very much, Informally. Michael. So, um, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Tom, and thanks, Lawrence, for the invitation to come to this uh, lovely city. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, my name is Peter Gregg, and I'm the president and CEO of a company called Intersource Corporation. It's in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, just to the immediate west of uh, Toronto. Um, <clears throat> a little bit something that Tom said off the top, um, where we have been uh, spending our efforts uh, in the last two years, I've been with Intersource two years now, is uh, on a consolidation effort. Uh, Ontario is a bit unique in that there are still about 70 local distri distribution companies serving approximately 4 million uh, customers in Ontario. Um, and uh, we're going through, I think, a, th a phase of uh, consolidation that will take place over the next decade or so. So when I arrived at Intersource, we decided that we would like to lead the consolidation effort rather than sit and uh, wait for something to happen. Um, and so we approached uh, some of our neighboring um, distribution companies, started discussions on a, uh, on a uh, merger. Uh, at the same time, an interesting acquisition uh, opportunity became available, and we decided to add an acquisition to it at the same time. So it's uh, been one of the most complex exercises that you can imagine. Uh, figuring out there are seven shareholders involved in the, uh, the merging entity, um, six of which are municipalities and one is a pension fund. Uh, and then we're buying a distribution utility from the province of Ontario that used to be owned by Hydro One, the large uh, transmitter distributor uh, in Ontario. So it's been a complex undertaking. Uh, why are we doing it? Uh, we think consolidation is in the interest of, of ratepayers and of shareholders. Um, Ontario has been characterized, I think, very differently than what Eric spoke about with Quebec. I think Quebec has had a very, very singular and committed vision to the future. I think, you know, I'm, I'm far enough away from Ontario that maybe I could be a little critical. Um, I think Ontario has not had a similar committed vision for decades, unfortunately. Um, we've made some good decisions, policy decisions. Um, but what we're dealing with uh, from a ratepayer perspective in Ontario is uh, prices that, uh, as, as Eric said, are double uh, in Toronto than what you pay in Montreal. Um, and that really has been driven by uh, the province's desire to get off of coal power generation and replace as much of that with renewable energy as possible. And they did that through feed-in tariff programs, so fixed price contracts for 20 years uh, to encourage that market to go. And those costs, so we've rapidly expanded into wind, solar, biomass, uh, of about 35,000 megawatts of installed capacity. We've got about 4,000 megawatts of renewables. Um, it has been expensive, um, and those, those uh, costs are being passed on to consumers. So consumers have seen a steady trajectory up of their price, where for decades previous, it was just a, basically a flat price. Um, so consumers are now asking questions, why is my, my price going up? What are you doing to maintain the costs? Um, from a distribution perspective, we're only about 22% of the bill. Um, so it's, it's difficult for us to control all of that, but there still is an opportunity to get more productive. So we're looking at reducing the, the redundancy, taking out duplication, and ultimately we're creating a company that will have approximately a million customers um, serving the western part of Toronto and a bit of the northern part of Toronto, um, and about $3.2 billion worth of assets. Right. That's, that's, uh what I find, found interesting, um, among, among other things, is the, the ability to consolidate uh, basically three companies and an acquisition all at the same time. Um, what, were the, what were the impediments in, what are the impediments in accomplishing this, and how do you assure that the investor gets something out of it? It's, it's clear what the customer gets. How do you assure the investor gets something out of it? The impediments, uh, I think, fortunately, we had common alignment of shareholders. Um, you know, there's a bit of differences there. Um, but I think the, the shareholders uh, have been committed to this throughout. And even though it's been an 18-month process, and I should say we're at the stage where we've signed the legal agreements, we're now going through the regulatory process to get this approved. So we hope to close the transaction in the fall. Um, so that's the stage that we're at. So I think we've had good cooperation amongst the shareholders. That really hasn't been a problem. Um, we've actually had a smooth transition. To pull this off in a relatively short time frame shows that there has been commonality of vision. Um, the unions, there are five different unions. Um, that will be a challenge as we get into uh, certifying one single union. 
I think employees have also, uh, we've, we've taken great efforts to communicate often and openly with employees uh, who are concerned about whether or not they're going to have a job, concerned whether or not they're going to have to move locations. So that has been maybe not an impediment, but it has been a challenge that we've had to deal with and we'll continue to have to deal with. But I think, you know, it's from a complex transaction, we've been um, fortunate uh, that I think um, shareholders, management teams, have had um, their eye on the bigger uh, goal to, sp to uh, deliver savings to ratepayers uh, and to deliver those dividend streams. So we built a very solid business case, presented that to, rate to the shareholders to say, here's your dividend growth profile on our business plan over the next 25 years. And I think it was a compelling case. Is it similar to what was done about 20 years ago now, I guess, uh, in the UK where the uh, RECs as they were called, were, were uh, divested or, or were uh, sold to many U.S. utilities. And there was a, a period of time where you had, um, you didn't have to go in for a rate case. Yeah. There was no reset. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, I read something uh, about your situation where there's a requirement for a reset every 10 years. So you get to keep the savings for that period of time until it, there's a reset? It is, yeah. That's, that's new. Uh, up until about uh, eight months ago, it was a five-year period where you wouldn't have to go back to see the regulator. They introduced a new policy. Um, and I think the policy wasn't by accident. They saw what we were doing, and, and certainly the province and the regulator has been cons um, really encouraging consolidation uh, from a ratepayer benefit. So I think they saw what we were doing, and they did introduce a new policy so we can stay out without rebasing for a period of 10 years, which means that as long as we're able to execute our business plan well, that our, our shareholders should be able to reap the benefits of that. Back to the first part of your question, it's not the same as what uh, happened in, in the UK, I believe. So, you know, most of the 70 utilities that I mentioned, distribution utilities, are still municipally owned uh, by and large. There's been a great demand by external investors to come in and actually buy them. Um, but we've got a fairly punitive transfer tax um, that uh, if, if someone outside of the municipal regime wanted to buy, it's a big tax hit. They did reduce the tax about a year ago for a period of three years uh, to try to encourage some, uh, some more market activity. I don't think it was enough because it's still a, a punitive tax. Rather than 33%, it's now 22%. Um, so it is keeping those outside investors from uh, actually buying these utilities, which I think is unfortunate. Um, so the trans that's why really it was a merger. Um, and we're because we're owned predominantly by municipalities, we're able to buy the other utility without incurring without a large tax hit. Tax. Yeah. You, you mentioned the, the increase that has been seen through feed and tariffs, and so your, your experience is the same as, as many in Europe experienced. What is the customer reaction, and how does your company, or how is your company seen, even though you, you are really not responsible for that, how is it seen uh, with, from customer satisfaction to, to, to be helping them rather than uh, absorbing it. Well, it, that, that has been a real challenge for, for all of us in, in the sector. Um, and the first thing you can't do is you can't point the finger at somebody else and say they're causing the problem because consumers don't want to hear that. They don't, they don't necessarily understand who the different players are in the sector and who made decisions to incur those costs. Our name is on the bill, so they're going to assume that it's something we've done. So we can't pass the buck and, and uh, really point the fingers to the government. And the reality is there really are government policies that have, have driven this. Um, so our view is that uh, customers are asking questions. I think for decades in Ontario, everybody knew we had Niagara Falls. It ran, people assume they get their power from Niagara Falls. And so you flick, flick the switch. The I light. believe that in Las Vegas with Hoover, where yeah. we get about 1% of our yeah, power no, from it's Hoover not, Dan. No, They flick the switch and the power's on and the bills were relatively stable for a long time. So nobody ever asked questions. And the, the biggest challenge of a utility was try to get customers to pay attention to you. Well, that's shifted now. <laughs> so customers are getting the same product for a lot more and are asking the question, well, what am I, I'm not getting any more value. So what, why am I paying that? And it has caused customer satisfaction rates across the board have really started to tank. Um, and what we're doing is trying to reinforce that relationship with the customer. Um, we have been a trusted uh, partner with them for decades. Um, and really, our, what we're trying to do is become the customer advocate. So help them understand what is changing, help them understand what they can do to actually manage their bill, 
And a big reason, a big um, sort of benefit of what we're saying is consolidation is that through our consolidation efforts, with our businesses coming together, we're actually able to re remove duplication and reduce costs for you. So we've been selling it from that perspective. When you look at the ability to grow uh, post the, the merger, is there, are there opportunities for expansion of the distribution network um, to allow for investment to also be part of, of your growth? Or is it, is it because of the rate setting mechanism that the least, least investment you can make, the better the, the uh, shareholder will be? There, there will be, I'm assuming you're talking about sort of organic investment in yeah. plant. Um, there will be opportunities for investment. Mississauga, this was, that was one of the reasons we wanted to look at expanding the way we did. For my service territory, our growth is, is pretty limited. We're essentially built out as a municipality. Um, so forging a merger and an acquisition uh, in an area that's got more growth, so designated place, places to grow in Brampton service territory and in Markham and Vaughan, they're places that have quite large population growth. Um, so we will have an opportunity to continue to invest and grow those, those assets. Um, from an acquisition opportunity, um, I probably should have brought a map so we could show where, where we are, but there are, I think there are further consolidation opportunities um, in terms of, of acquisitions of other municipally owned uh, utilities in the immediate area. So while we're at a million customers, my vision would be to get to about 1.5 million customers, and we've certainly got our, our targets that we're, lo we're looking at. Are you, either through regulation or practice, limited to what you can invest in, or can you invest outside your, your current core competency, so to speak? That is changing. Um, so on the regulated side of the business, we are limited as to what we can invest in. The regulator does oversee that. But uh, we do have unregulated businesses, a number of them. So we do have uh, assets in the solar generation, rooftop solar. Um, we're allowed to invest in, in, in generation assets. Um, we do have meter service provider company. We have a sweet metering company. We have a street light um, maintenance company. Um, we also do, we manage all the electric electricity infrastructure at Toronto's Pearson Airport. Um, so on our unregulated side of the business, which is about, you know, compared to the 3.2 billion in assets on the regulated, we're only at about 300 million on the unregulated side, but we do intend to, to grow on that side of the business as well. Questions for Peter from the audience. Hello. Hi, um, Lisa Wood from EEI. Hi, Lisa I, Wood. Hi, Michael. How are you? Um, I have a question. Um, I don't know the details of this, but about a year and a half ago, I was talking to one of the regulators in Ontario who said that Ontario has put in place a distribution grid charge that would be implemented over a four-year period so that customers would pay flat out for the cost of the distribution grid. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's one of the big issues we have in the U.S. that we don't we know we, we only pay a small amount for our grid and we collect the rest through the um, through the retail rate. So can you talk a little bit about how that got put in place and and um, what you see happening with that? I, I can speak, it, it's at the early stages, and you're right, the Ontario Energy Board is moving to a sort of a fixed distribution charge and it's going to be transitioning over the next four to five years. So we're just at the beginning of that. That was a policy decision. It wasn't something that we were advocating for in the industry. It was a policy, policy decision. And I think it was really to, to go to consumers to say, um, you know, with the bills going up, that there was going to be sort of a, a fixed price. You knew what your distribution charge was going to be. Um, I think that's fine from a consumer perspective. My concern with that is with the fixed price, um, I expected a future rate case that uh, interveners are going to say, well, you've got a fixed price now, so your risk um, is lower, your risk profile is lower, so your rate of return right. can therefore be lower. Um, so that really has been, from an investor side of, of perspective, uh, that's been our concern. I think it is a consumer-friendly um, perspective, so from a ratepayer perspective, I can support that, but I am concerned that it will result uh, potentially in a lower rate of return. Elliot. I recognize that face. Um, <clears throat> yes, Elliot Roseman with ICF. Um, could you talk a bit about the growth of distributed energy resources that you're seeing in Ontario, uh, the rooftop solar, the cogen, the storage, uh, even energy efficiency? Uh, is that causing an impact on the level of distribution investment? Uh, we're seeing yeah. in a number of utilities here that 
depending on the location, that there is an impact on feeders, on substations. And I'm curious as to whether in Ontario you're beginning to see that have an impact on your distribution investment. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's, it's, there's been a massive impact um, on, on the distribution grid and on the transmission grid. Um, I think when we went into the policy, the provincial policy on feed-in tariffs, it was a bit of an open season. Um, and at the time that was uh, put into practice, I was actually working at Hydro One on the, the transmission side. Um, and uh, there was not much consideration given to where these, these facilities were to be located. Um, so they could be, uh, you know, at the end of a very small feeder, and it required a huge amount of uh, investment to, to connect those. And, and with the feed in, in tariff contract, there was a guaranteed connection. Um, so it required transmitters and distributors to actually put in place the investment to make sure that they can connect. So we have been dealing with that. I think when I think of that, that in the future, so we do have rooftop solar at the distribution level. Um, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more storage at the distribution level. We're actually working with, with Tesla, the early stages of working with Tesla on their power wall technology. Um, and we're actually in, in 20 homes recently. We've just done some small microgrid installations with some rooftop solar, some lithium ion batteries, um, and sort of testing out that concept of islanding off from the grid and doing a little price arbitrage because we do have time of use pricing. So allowing consumers to store energy at night when it's cheap use the electricity from the battery during the daytime to, to manage their bills. So we're getting into that, that uh, part of the, the business as well as a pilot um, uh, program. Um, I think, you know, when I think about the future of a distribution utility, and I think this is one of the reasons too we wanted to create the, the larger utility to have the scale and the scope to do it, because now that you're managing two-way power flows on the distribution level, you're getting intermittent power, you're going to potentially have storage. I think distributors are going to become more like a small ISO and uh, like a distribution service op uh, system operator. And we've been having discussions with the uh, IESO in Ontario about that, that that's not really the space they want to be in. They've got enough to do at their level, and they're encouraging the consolidation as well that we would emulate at the distribution level sort of a system operator status. So that's where I see the future going. Hi, Sarah Fairhurst from the Lantau Group. I was interested uh, to hear your opening remarks about um, the fact you were merging with, uh, with uh, other people in your area. I have uh, similar issues in the Philippines. There is lots and lots of very small municipal distributors still, and it's very easy to see that they ought, there ought to be consolidation, and yet there isn't. Um, what what would you say are the, the top three arguments I could take back to the Philippines and, and use with my, uh, with my distribution utility customers to say, this is why you really ought to go and talk to your neighbors and start consolidating? Great question. Um, see if I come up with three. Um, the, the, first, the first one, and, and so when I, when I joined Intersource and I went and spoke to our, so we're 90% owned by the municipality of Mississauga and 10% owned by a pension fund. And when I went with the vision of, of consolidation, what I sold was the sort of the, the level of industry change that we've been experiencing in Ontario and beyond. So part of that's the renewable um, integration. Um, a large, large part of it is the price increases that have already happened and are going to happen and consumer dissatisfaction with that. And so you paint a picture of the change that's happening um, and the change that you expect to happen um, in the next decade. And so my thesis was consolidation is a necessity. It will happen whether you like it or not. And a lot of municipalities like to own their own um, infrastructure for whatever reason. Maybe they think it's sexy, I don't know. Um, but some of them also, some of the politicians also sit on the boards of these utilities and get, a, get paid and there's all those natural impediments. Um, but, but what I tried to sell was the change is coming, the change is going to happen, and you have a choice to make. You can sit back and watch it, um, and maybe you'll have an opportunity in the future, but you don't control it, or we can actually go out there and lead the change and, and set, the, set the die um, for how it's going to be done in the, in the future. And that really, I think, was the, the key success factor here, is that I think I convinced them that change is going to happen, um, and that there's risk if you're not active in leading that change. Um, and uh, thankfully, they were supportive uh, throughout. So there are probably three elements in there, but it was really around, around the change. Um, and I think, you know, 
really always said from the beginning that there need to be um, shareholder, clear shareholder benefits and clear consumer benefits. And as long as you can paint the, that picture and commitment that, there, that both shareholders will improve, see improved dividend returns and uh, customers will also see reduced um, bills. Yes, sir. Hi, Michael Eisman from G Power. Um, good morning. You mentioned the uh, the ten years between the the rate case. Um, I think there there are two sides in that in that argument. There, one is gives utilities sort of the breathing room and the incentive to innovate. The other side is it sort of allows for complacency. You know, ten years, I haven't got to do anything. So, talk. Can you talk a little bit about how you and your peers? Are viewing that? Is it? Have, do you sort of feel on the ground, sort of this move to innovate, or is it? Are, are you kind of too wrapped up right now in the uh, in the consolidation to kind of think over the next? Uh, so you've hit on one of the, the key concerns I think we, we've got is that integrating utility like this is going to be a major undertaking. Um, we've got to integ integrate um, customer billing systems. That in itself is a massive challenge. Um, we've got to integrate their enterprise systems, you know, from an IT perspective alone, integrate cultures. Um, that is a critical success factor for the future. So we are very focused on that. And our shareholders have, have really told us we want you to focus on that because your success on integration is directly attributable to dividends increasing or not. Um, so we're told focus on that. Um, that said, we can't take our eye off the ball in terms of innovation either. So it's, it's a real balance. Um, so that's why we are um, working with partners. Um, where, where we're really focused in terms of innovation is looking at uh, the whole concept of microgrid. Microgrid for um, industrial applications, microgrid for remote community applications. So we are working with companies. We've got partnership with Kepco out of Korea. Um, working on a microgrid installation. The 20 houses I spoke about before with rooftop solar combined with uh, lithium ion batteries to test its islanding concept, we are doing that. So we, we, we hope to be able to balance um, the, the focus on innova innovation and investing in that in the future with the, uh, the consolidation efforts. But the consolidation efforts and integration efforts are really the foundation. If we don't get that right, we don't have the right to do anything else. Lawrence, are we? One more question. The gentleman with the coffee and the thing. Yes. Exactly. Sorry, Doug Arendt. Uh, I'm at the Joint Institute for uh, Energy Analysis at the National Renewable Energy Lab. A question relative to your um, the the quality or the sourcing of power <coughs> that you that you buy. So, as a distribution company, do you have any influence over no. or responsibility for? The footprint of your power, and then also, how do you, uh, per the earlier question, how does distributed energy resource then fit into that kind of strategic thinking? So the simple answer to the first part is no. We have no authority or input into it at all. We're asked from a policy perspective on it, and we'll give our opinion. Um, but really, as a grid operator, we're agnostic to as to what what source of power. Um, what was the second part? Sorry, there was a second. How does and distributed energy, again, um, you know, it was with feed-in tariffs, you make your application, you get your contract, and off you go. And really, really the impact on a distributor is that you've got an obli obligation to connect. So we don't really have any input there either. It's just we've got to make the investments required to be able to ensure that that generator can connect to our distribution grid. I guess the one benefit is that um, the regulator does see that those re investments are required, so we have had success in and getting that put in, but uh, no, we're we're not uh, accountable. We're expected to be responsive to the changes. Peter, thank you very much. Thank Sounds you like much. you have a lot of challenges in front of you, but very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it very much.